So, uh, like the title would suggest, is our criminal justice system, uh, is there victim justice in our criminal justice system? And uh, is it a reality or a rhetoric? So, I will try to bring the focus into the imbalance in the um, uh, system when it comes to uh, looking at victim justice and uh, uh, the justice to the accused persons. So uh, like um, children would always begin with these questions, they always have questions. So I always believe that it's nice to try to answer these questions. And when we ask questions, we learn. So uh, let's begin. I always uh, call these the five W's and the one H. So what is our role as a legal uh, fraternity? And why is it crucial that we intervene now in favor of victim justice? And where do we begin? Where do we begin to talk about this? And when do we respond? And which are the areas in which we, as a part of the legal fraternity, can make a difference? And uh, if there is an imbalance, how can we change the status quo? So let's try to look at this, uh, look at these questions and try to together find answers uh, for these relevant and very, very pertinent questions. So there is uh, a saying by John Starr. He said that justice isn't served till crime victims are. So this whole justice system is only for the crime victims is what he has said. And when we uh, look at what he has said vis-a-vis uh, -vis our current system, we see that there is a huge imbalance. So um, there is another saying by Maya Angelou who said that I've learned that people might forget what you did. People will forget what you said, but they will never forget how you make them feel. So this is what I'm trying to uh, make everybody understand and we need to deliberate on this. How do we make a victim feel when he or she enters our criminal justice system? So this is a very, very complicated system. Like we who are part of the system still grop, uh, grapple with the um, nitty gritties of this system. So from the time you enter into the system and the prosecution and the pretrial services, the adjudication, the sentencing and the correctional system. So how complicated this whole system is. So when a victim enters the system, how we make her or him feel when they pass through the system. So this is what will remain with the uh, victim. So the need for this whole system to be victim friendly is what we'll try to understand how it's done and whether it's done and how it's done in the rest of the world as well. So uh, coming to look at it, we know as uh, people in the legal fraternity and people who uh, know the law that the victim is the most important person of the criminal justice system, the VIP. And why do we say that? It's because only if he or she registers the first information report or calls the police or dials 100 or 199, whatever it is. So only when this happens is the whole system set in motion. Nothing can happen till the victim uh, registers that complaint or calls for help. So the victim is indeed the most important person in the criminal justice system. So if not for this victim, the whole criminal justice system in all its glory will cease to be functional. We might have our courts and our police stations and uh, all the system, the criminal justice system, the correctional system, everything in place. But without the victims, uh, taking the first step, this whole system would be uh, non-functional. So that's how important we're trying to bring home the fact of how what an important role this victim plays and why he or she should be treated in a way that uh, is victim friendly. So there, there were a series of international crime victimization surveys conducted all over the world. And this uh, was conducted 
to study why victims did not report crimes. So there were many, many reasons. That's a whole new lecture altogether. But then most of it had to do with the way the police were treating them, the way the uh, lawyers were treating them, and many other reasons. So we won't go into that, but it is just for your knowledge. So the International Crime Victimization Survey showed that many, many crimes went unreported. And it was because of the way the function, the criminal justice system functioned uh, largely. So uh, we saw that the more they do not report crime, what happens? The dark figures of crime increase. So the unreported crimes, the numbers are humongous when you look at it uh, world over. So these unreported crimes, they're not captured in our, say, for example, our National Crime Records Bureau, our NCRB, does not capture these statistics in the country. Now, uh, about a year ago, the Bureau of Police Research and Development has uh, started a pan-India survey, a victimization survey, the first of its kind in the country. So we just began and we uh, sorted out everything, got the questions finalized and the pandemic came. So that's kept on hold. So we have to see because India was not included in the list of countries where they had this crime victimization surveys done. So we have to see, we have to wait for the report of the BPRD. So when you talk about the criminal justice system, we need to look at all the four wings. So the legislative wing, whether the citizens have made acts that are uh, victim friendly and whether the enforcement wing. Now we have in the legislations, we have a, a, a compensation for uh, sexual crimes. So, but we do not have a comprehensive victim uh, legislation per se. So that is where we need to uh, look at this area as well. And it comes to the enforcement, whether the enforcement, whether the police are victim friendly. We have in Tamil Nadu had introduced the all women police station, which was uh, uh, brought into being for that particular purpose. Uh, so we have to see how that uh, helps the victim in reporting the crime. And looking at the judicial wing, we need to see what is the uh, contribution of the victim in the courts, whether the victims are allowed to give their victim impact statement or whether they are treated just as prosecution witnesses, one, two, three, uh, whatever. So we need to look at that as well. So the, and the, finally, the correctional wing. Here again, we might wonder what do the prisons and the correctional uh, system have to do with the victims? But here again, there are uh, developed countries where uh, the information is given to the victim when the offender is out on uh, uh, bail or parole or whatever. So this information will help the victim in securing himself. So these are the uh, a whole, this is the whole system we need to look at to see whether all these four wings, what do they do, how they contribute to making this criminal justice system a uh, victim friendly one or not. So we have had many, many victim friendly uh, judges and we have uh, quotations, uh, especially of uh, a late uh, Justice Krishnayar. He said that the victims are the Cinderella of the criminal justice system. And then we had Justice Malimath who headed the Malimath Commission. And when he submitted his report, this is what he said. He said the criminal justice system in India favors the accused. So this, these things were said way back, and uh, but we see that we still do not have a comprehensive victim legislation in our country. But uh, when I was in the U.S. as a Fulbright scholar, we saw that there there was the same uh, kind of situation that we have in India, where victims are ignored, and they had set up a president's task force. There was Justice Hate, a woman who was chairing that. And then she said in her report that the criminal justice system uh, treatment of crime victims in the US was a national disgrace. But as soon as this was said, they set, a, they set the ball in motion and they introduced victim-friendly procedures, victim-friendly legislations and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So I'm just trying to see that uh, we know what the problem is, but we are still not addressing the problem. 
So that was in the US and in Australia as well. Uh, Justice Russell Fox said, what is justice? Justice means fairness. And what is fairness? Fairness means truth. And what is truth? Truth means the reality. And the search for the truth gives a legal system its moral dimension. So we, there is need for the legal system to have a moral dimension as well. Otherwise, the likely winner would be the one with the most money and the cleverest lawyers. So this is why we need to understand the need for um, victim-friendly procedures and victim-friendly legislations in our criminal justice system. So we have a lot of research has been done uh, as to see uh, what the victim needs from this criminal justice system. So victims and their families have uh, gone on record to say that we have been referred to as the stepchildren of the criminal justice system. So that is how we have made them feel. This, that is how our system has made the victims feel. And they say again that our rights and concerns are grossly ignored or misunderstood. So we need to find out what the victim needs from the uh, system. What is the expectation of the victim? And we need to match our services to the expectations of the victim. So uh, it's, uh, I don't know if it's a consolation, but we can say that this is not the uh, position only in uh, India. It is all over the world where you have this kind of uh, second class treatment uh, for the victims of crime in the criminal justice system. So in the European Union, because I did research on this area when I traveled around the world. So in the European Union, they have set up a council directive which deals with compensation to victims. So it is not automatic. It has to go through this uh, council. But of course, it is a uh, much better place than uh, our victims in uh, the developing countries. Uh, but you see in some developed countries in Canada as well, they had a Bill of Rights which spoke about uh, victim rights, but they did not have a uh, enforcement mechanism. So it's something like the, uh, when I say it does not have an enforcement uh, mechanism, it's something like our fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy. You see that our fundamental rights are enforceable in a court of law. And whereas the directive principles of uh, state policy are uh, a decorative principle of state policy and not enforceable. So this is what was the position in Canada when uh, I visited and I've written about it in 2013. So you see in England and Wales, again, uh, there again, uh, the uh, inclusion of the victim is still at its infancy. So it's uh, not really helping the victim, but it's kind of uh, putting a, a plaster on the wounds of victims. And it's not uh, designed to serve the victims of crime. The system has, is made for a totally different purpose. It is uh, justice to the accused. So it's just like sticking plaster over a system designed for a totally different purpose. This is what we found in UK as well. And coming to Australia, until recently, they have um, victim rights, but they did not have penalties for non-compliance. If the victim was denied his or her rights, there was no penalty. But now, uh, subsequently, they have set that right. So you see that this uh, repeats this saga of for the victims repeat itself in all the countries world over. In South Africa as well, the constitution section 31 says that uh, any person belonging to cultural or religious or a linguistic uh, community may not be denied the right to enjoy their culture, their practice of their religion. So this also led to a lot of victimization the genital, female genital mutilation. It happened under the garb of the culture. So uh, this was again, uh, not a very victim friendly uh, system when you looked at it. Then in uh, Hungary, in the uh, Eastern European world as well. So here the police, they needed a certificate. Uh, the victim needed a certificate from the police to initiate any victim support. And we saw that in Hungary, the whole uh, victim services was only with lawyers. 
So there were not many psychologists. And like we know, the lawyers are trained uh, in a different skill. They have a different skill. But when the victims need compassion, they need to be uh, involved with uh, psychologists as well. So this is what we found. You need to have a more humane approach and a human face. So there were too many lawyers in the system. And that was not very, very victim friendly for the uh, victims as reported in Hungary. Then in Indonesia, coming to Indonesia, which is again, uh, a developing country like ours, but they have a victim legislation as well. And we still do not have it. But here again, the victims still remain as faceless parties and their, uh, their rights are not legally protected. Like they're not enforceable victim rights as yet. And coming to Japan, a very advanced country, here again, there are victim rights and everything in place, but the stigma is so much that sexual uh, victims do not approach uh, the services in the criminal justice system, but they go to the medical uh, system uh, to get um, treatment for any assault. So the laws are there, but again, the mindset of the people prevents victims from coming and accessing the facilities available in the law. So uh, coming to US, US is the only country that I've seen that has uh, enforceable victim rights. So here they have uh, victim rights and they are enforceable. But again, when you look into it, because I had to critically uh, study the uh, situation in the US. So they had uh, victim uh, rights all right. But when I looked at it, what I saw was uh, these rights were not uh, authoritative, not affirmative rights like we have for uh, the um, rights of the accused, say the DK Basu judgment. And in the US, they have the Miranda uh, uh, statement. So these are all very affirmative and very solid rights. But for the victims, you see the rights, I've just uh, uh, put it in the slide for you, the right to be reasonably protected from the accused. So what is this reasonable? It's a very relative term. It's not affirmative. It's not affirmative like the rights of the accused. Then the right to be to reasonable, accurate, and timely uh, uh, notice of any uh, public procedure. Then uh, the right to be reasonably heard. So what is this reasonable? The right, the reasonable right to confer with the uh, uh, attorney for the government in the case. See, these are the words which make these rights what I call very watery. So they're not uh, affirmative, but they're very watery rights. Then the right to proceedings free from unreasonable delay. So what is this reasonable and what is this um, uh, unreasonable? So these are relative terms. You cannot guarantee a victim justice with these terms. So the only country which has uh, enforceable rights, the crime victims, act in the US, they also have these kind of um, challenges that the victim has to face. So whereas look at the offender rights, they are absolute rights, they're affirmative rights. So they say that shall, the uh, police shall do this and the uh, police should do this. And uh, um, uh, there is no uh, watery rights here. So you see the difference. This is what we are trying to show the difference between the rights of the victims uh, when they have it and the right of the accused in a country, even like India, where we do not have victim rights. So there is the, the use of these affirmative words, the absolute rights, like I, uh, I would call them. So when you see this, what do you think we need? We need a more inclusive justice system where all the stakeholders are held accountable. So now what happens in our system? We have the uh, state pitted against the offender. So what happens? The state is very powerful. The offender uh, seems helpless in comparison to the state. So our focus is again on protecting the uh, uh, weak and vulnerable person that is the offender. So that is where our concentration goes. So we do not have an inclusive system where the victim is also part of the uh, procedure. When you pit the offender versus the state, obviously the offender uh, gets our attention as being the weaker one and 
the one who needs our protection and the victim is left out of this uh, whole uh, procedure. So we need to have a more inclusive justice system where all the stakeholders are held accountable. So when you look at uh, this system, what is the other alternate system? Uh, our system, the reality in India today is the retributive system. And the ideal one would be the restorative justice system. So when you look at the vision, what is the vision of uh, justice in uh, the retributive system? We look at punishing the offender. We do not worry about reparation for the victim. We define crime as violation of a law. We do not define crime as an injury which violates the victim. When you define justice, you talk about the process or the right rules to be followed, the procedure, but we do not worry about the victim's satisfaction. And the outcome of this retributive justice is punishment. But we need to think about the victim and the restitution, that is the compensation given by the offender and compensation, which is given by the state. And in many cases, an apology. Sometimes the victims need just an apology for what the offender has done to them. So these are the different uh, types of uh, outcomes and the definitions in our retributive justice system. And when you see how we understand crime, we understand crime in purely legal terms to say that this has this particular act has violated a particular uh, section of the uh, Indian Penal Code. So we do not understand that crime as having an impact on the victim. And this impact can be physical, it can be material, it can be psychological, it can be financial. So the different types of victimizations that um, and, and the impact of that victimization, but we do not try to understand that in our system. Then the role of the offender is a very passive one in this system, and it depends on the proxy professional. He does not say anything. He does not take responsibility. He's not held accountable. So, uh, and in the, uh, the as for the uh, victim, the victim's role also is very, very minimal as a prosecution witness, one or two. The victim does not have any say in the uh, in this system. So when you look at the closure in this retributive justice system, we end up with either an acquittal or a conviction. But if it is an acquittal, do we find the wrongdoer? So the wrongdoer is still at large and there is no justice for the victim. So that's our closure in our system. So in a nutshell, if you look at our present retributive justice system, we are focusing on the past. We are focusing on the pain inflicted on the offender. Whereas ideally, we would need to look at the future of the victim, of the community, and to see what you gain from this experience. So it's interesting that there was a, uh, Tamil and a Hindi film made many years ago, I think when we were children, it was called uh, uh, Dost, I think in Hindi and in Tamil it was called Nidi, in which a victim, uh, uh, an offender was drunk and he drives a lorry and kills a particular uh, bread uh, breadwinner of the family. So in that uh, justice system, the judge asks this offender to go live in the village with that family and provide for that family because they have lost the breadwinner. So the judge had ordered that this particular person, the offender, live in the community and help that widowed um, uh, uh, lady and the um, uh, victim's sister and the victim's brother to uh, meet their daily expenses with his earnings. So this is what is restorative justice. They talk about the future of the victim, reparation for the victim, what the victim has lost and how can you compensate for that and not focusing on the uh, punishment of the offender or putting him away in jail. So this was interesting that as a child, I watched this movie and I was not a criminologist back then. 
but uh, um, thinking about it, thinking back, I think how proactive that uh, particular director or filmmaker was. So uh, uh, looking back, we also had this kind of a system where we involved the victim and the family and the offender and his family. And we had kind of a um, uh, family uh, conference, a family group conference. So this was done, but uh, like you all know, we had the system in our villages. But uh, uh, after the introduction of the British uh, law and the criminal justice system, we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater and we have left the victims out of the system. So we had in our history, this kind of a justice system where we involved and we took into account what the victim has lost and we tried to uh, give back to the victim what he was, what he or she had lost. And we held the uh, uh, offender accountable, which we do not do now because the victim, the offender is presumed innocent till he's proven guilty. So he does not take, uh, he's not accountable. So all these things about the victim, it's, it's a very uh, recent uh, idea as far as, as early as uh, uh, 1985, the Declaration on the Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power was introduced. So this is a document which uh, uh, talks about the different types of uh, help that a victim needs and the different type of um, uh, ways in which the criminal justice uh, system can uh, address these needs. So this document, the basic principles of justice for victims of crime and abuse of power, uh, 1985, it envisages that the criminal justice system should provide access to justice and fair treatment to victims when they enter the police station, how they are treated in a court of law, how they are treated. So you need to make just as more accessible to these victims to uh, help them come into the system and ask for justice. And this document also talks about restitution. Like I said earlier, in India, we still do not have two separate uh, terms for this. Restitution is compensation given by the offender to the victim. And compensation is the uh, given to the victim by the state. So these are two different terms. In most developed countries, the victim is eligible for restitution as well as for compensation. And the other thing that this uh, document envisages is assistance, the different type of assistance that we can give them, material assistance, psychological assistance, financial, legal assistance, these things. So these, when the all women police stations uh, were first introduced in uh, Tamil Nadu, we had when we are involved, you see that when a victim enters the station, there is a list of uh, persons with the contact numbers, uh, a social worker, a doctor, um, a lawyer. So these people would assist the victim in the process because like we saw, this criminal justice system is very, very complicated. So they need some help to uh, get them through the system and to try to access the justice that has been denied to them. So this is the basis of all the uh, uh, victim rights that we speak about this uh, declaration. So this declaration has uh, guaranteed 10 rights for victims. One is to be treated with compassion and respect. Then the right to information, because when these victims come into the system, they are confused. They do not know what is happening next. When uh, will they get justice? They have so many questions like we had in the beginning of this presentation. So they have millions of questions. So they have a right to information. You need to have people who would help them through this, not just uh, tell them, okay, you filed your complaint, go home. When we call you, you come. So they, this is what they have a right to information and they have the right to present their views in courts. In developed countries, you see the victim impact statement. So the victim comes to the court and tells the uh, judge and uh, about how this particular act has impacted his or her life. So their views are presented, presented to the court. Then they have a right to free legal aid. This we have in our country. 
and then they have a right to protection of privacy and physical safety. So this is very important, how you have uh, uh, the ambience, the atmosphere in the police station when a woman, say, comes to report her crime, say it's a sexual crime. She needs the privacy. She needs the physical safety to talk about what has happened to her. So this is another basic right according to this declaration. And then they have a right to informal dispute, uh, dispute resolution, like we have this uh, uh, mediation reconciliation, these kind of things, the informal dispute resolution. So we have that in our country as well for family uh, uh, cases and things like that, family violence. So, uh, and they have a right to social and medical uh, assistance as well. Restitution, that's another right in this document, in this document. Compensation, that's another right. And the cooperation, the capacity building and the cooperation of all uh, those concerned. So you see, along with this um, UN declaration in 85, they had released two other documents, the Handbook on Justice to Victims, uh, which it, this came in 1999. And this very clearly talks, I'm sure all of you would find it very, very useful if you have a look at these documents, they're available online. And they have, it, this document has five sections. First, it talks about the different impact of victimization. So we would, as lawyers, try to understand what uh, what could have been the impact on this particular victim when they come to us. So the different types of impact of victimization. And section two talks about the uh, victim assistance, what type of assistance you can give these victims depending on their need. And the section three talks about the roles and responsibilities of the frontline professionals. And who are these frontline professionals? We, the police, the lawyers. So we are the ones who come in contact with the victim in the aftermath of the victimization. So we are the frontline professionals. So it's very, very important that we deal with the victim in a way that uh, he is uh, um, encouraged to continue with the case and to see the case to the logical end. We should not be instrumental in chasing away the victim and uh, letting this also be another unreported crime and fall into the dark figures area of uh, the victimization survey that I spoke to you about. So, and the section four talks about the advocacy, the policy making. So what type of policy you need to help the victims? Section five talks about uh, working together to get the best practices from the different countries. I remember Indonesia, when they made their law, they had all the World Society of Victimology members. So we went and sat with them and they uh, made this legislation. So they are, uh, India is much ahead of Indonesia, but we still do not have a comprehensive victim uh, legislation. So another document that came with the UN Declaration on Victims is this, a guide for policymakers. So how to implement, how to go about implementing this. There are brilliant ideas for all the uh, different uh, areas of the criminal justice system. It's just 39 pages in that it's a small document, but it clearly defines the tasks and what is the goal of the declaration and how uh, uh, governments can develop support programs for victims and how uh, the policy makers should bear in mind that the victims deserve respect for their dignity and privacy and security. And all these are very, very uh, clearly given in this document. I would urge all of you to get hold of these documents and read it for a better understanding of the need of victims. So this document also stresses on the importance of establishing partnership with all agencies. So you cannot, victim justice is a multidisciplinary approach. You need to have people in the medical colleges treating the victim well when they go there for a checkup. You need to have people in the law fraternity, the police, the NGOs, everyone. We need to work together. So it is, uh, there is a lot of need for this networking. So these are the three documents that are in place for the victims and India is has ratified the UN declaration in 1985. So, uh, but still, you, we all know that a declaration is uh, like the uh, directive principles of state policy. It's not legally binding, but you need a convention which is legally binding, like the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was followed by those two conventions, which made it 
uh, and covenants which make it binding. So here, there are this proposed convention on support of victims of crime is still in the pipeline. So the World Society of Victimology and a lot of people are working and trying to get this uh, convention through the UN. But uh, there is uh, a lot of work to be done. So we need to establish programs to protect victims of crime. And unless it becomes a convention, will it be legally binding? Like the CEDAW, we had the CEDAW and India made a lot of laws uh, in, uh, in favor of women to prevent their victimization. Similarly, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that gave us a, a brand new juvenile justice legislation. So we are working towards just getting this convention through so that we will have some positive uh, impact in our country as well. So um, the uh, beauty of the definition in this of victim in this uh, declaration is that it, a victim, a person is considered a victim even if the perpetrator or the offender is uh, not identified, if he's not apprehended, if he's not prosecuted, if he's not convicted, regardless of all this, a person is considered a victim. You cannot say that we will wait till the uh, logical end of the case to decide whether this person gets the compensation or not. So this is the uh, uh, proactive definition of victim in this particular declaration. And also, it does not regard the familial relationship. It can be a uh, husband and wife. It can be a father and daughter. Uh, but still, the victim remains a victim. And this person becomes the offender, irrespective of the familial relationship. This is just to stress upon the need to uh, make the definition a very comprehensive one. We have just introduced the word victim in our uh, books very as recent as 2003. So the term victim also includes a vic the immediate family. So when you say victim, it's, it's again very comprehensive. The immediate family also is a victim. The dependents of the direct victims, they are also victims. The persons who have suffered harm while intervening to help the victim, they also fall into the bracket of victims. So when you try to assist the victim, if you are injured, then you are again brought into this uh, term victim. So this is how um, victim friendly this uh, declaration is. So in spite of all these documents, international instruments, we see that there is still an imbalance when it comes to victim rights and offender rights in this country. So now we're trying to look at why could this be? Like I said in the beginning, I have no answers. We have to uh, uh, look into it and do some research and find out. So there are many, many hypotheses. So we can, we'll just run through those. We have no uh, answers. We need to uh, find the answers. So uh, it could be because our criminal justice system, the adversarial system, the accusatorial system is based on this Roman doctrine. This Roman doctrine, we all know, it says that it was better to let the crime of a guilty person go unpunished than to condemn the innocent. And based on this, we had our William Blackstone's um, uh, uh, formula, which said it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent suffer. So let's for a minute try to rephrase this. When you make the statements, what does it imply? Let's see what it implies. When you say a hundred accused can go free, but one innocent man should not be punished. So what are you saying? You're saying a hundred victims may be denied justice, but one alleged offender should not be denied justice. So we need to contemplate, we need to think and see whether this is what would bring the uh, balance in the scales. So this criminal justice system, not only in India, in America, in Australia, and many countries all over the world, it's based on this common law system, which has its legal basis on, the, uh, on this legal maxim and the English legal system, the Blackstone's formulation. So we need to think whether um, this is what is causing the imbalance when it comes to victims' 
rights and offender rights. So this is an anecdote that I'd like to share with you. A law professor, he was once listening to an English uh, uh, lawyer saying that, oh, the English are so enlightened. They believe that it was better that 99 guilty men go free than one innocent man be excused, uh, executed. So the professor thought for a while and this, he said, better, better for whom? This is another question that we might uh, raise in our minds and see uh, what is happening in this system. So there are a lot of researchers about the Blackstone's maxim and uh, what it implies and how um, it has uh, caused this imbalance in the system. So many of them have called this a, a, a mere propaganda. They've called it a noble's lie. They've called it bunk. They've called it a myth. It uh, just brings out a warm and fussy feeling, says one of the researchers. It's merely argumentative, says um, another researcher. So we need to see that uh, there are these arguments, but still, this is the basis of our legal system. And we have uh, Justice Cardozo of the Supreme Court saying once that justice, though due to the accused, is due to the accuser also. That's our victim. The concept of fairness must not be strained till it's narrowed to a filament. We are to keep the balance true. So uh, in our quest for justice to the accused, what has happened? The Blackstone's formula, we have taken precaution over caution, and this has led to offenders going scot-free, impunity, no deterrence, no justice for victims. So this is what is the outcome of the precaution and the overcaution. So we had a, a, a philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, who said that we must be on guard against those sentimental exaggerations that tend to give crime impunity under the pretext of ensuring the safety of the innocent. So we need to keep our balance. So when we uh, have our justice system uh, in favoring the accused, what happens is Jeffrey Raymond in his book called The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, he has said this, he has made the statement, is this a criminal justice system or a criminal justice system? So who is this system for? So, when you see this uh, in, the, in the US, there was a law professor, um, uh, um, a person called uh, Susan Herman. I had a long talk with her when I was there. So she has written a book called The Parallel Justice. If you have this system, which is a criminal justice system, just for the criminals, just for the accused, we need to have a parallel system. We need to think of a victim justice system that will function for the victim. So maybe you have to go through that system and the system uh, that we are not sure. But these are the 10 principles she has given in her book about the um, victim justice system, calling it a parallel justice system. So in this, she says that all victims uh, deserve justice. And you need to help the victims rebuild their lives when, you, uh, when they go through the system. And just like we have uh, for the accused, all. Um, accused are presumed innocent till proven guilty. You need to have that for the victims as well. All victims should be presumed credible unless there is reason to believe otherwise. And victims face safety should be the top priority. And victims should experience no further harm. If you look at those UN documents, it's called secondary victimization. They have already undergone harm because of the particular crime that has been committed against them. So when we uh, do not treat them well in the police station, in the courts of law, everywhere else, in the hospitals, what happens is they suffer secondary victimization. So that sometimes is what pushes them away from our criminal justice system. So we need to ensure that this, uh, the victim should not experience further harm. They've suffered harm. They've come to report it to our justice system and we need to take care of them. 
and the victim's rights should be implemented, should be enforced. They should have an opportunity to talk about their experiences and not be treated just like PW1 and PW2. And uh, victims, there should be this acknowledgement. They should be told what has happened to them is wrong and every effort will be made to make it all right instead of going into the system where uh, the accused is presumed innocent and that makes him a liar. So this is what Susan Herman is trying to change in this uh, by in talking about this parallel justice system. I would urge you to get this book as well and uh, read it. it. It gives you a lot of insight into um, what is victim justice and why do we need victim justice. So uh, coming back to our system, when you talk about um, our system, though we do not have uh, a comprehensive victim legislations, we have uh, the victim compensation and the victim rights in the Constitution of India. We'll show you that and the judicial activism. And we have uh, Section um, 357 of the CRPC, which has proved to be a saving grace. We have the Law Commission reports, the Malimat Commission, the Justice Verma Commission, and uh, the 154th report and all these documents. And we have some special laws now, which are very, very victim friendly, the domestic violence, the POXO, the uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, senior citizens, SCST Act, and many other governmental initiatives as well. So though we do not have a comprehensive uh, legislation, we have some proactive uh, governmental orders and judgments, which would help the victims if interpreted well. So we need to apply our mind and interpret these uh, articles, these sections of the existing legislations. So uh, when we talk about um, the 154th Law Commission report, it said that the Constitution of India itself has embedded the principles of victimology in its uh, jurisprudence. So we need to look at the uh, constitution through the victimological lenses. So you see that Article 38, there is a provision of fundamental rights, Part 3, and the directive principles of uh, state policy. And uh, this talks about the new social order in which social and economic justice would blossom in the national life of the country. So this could be interpreted in favor of victims. Article 41 mandates that the state shall make effective provisions for securing the right to public assistance in cases of disablement and undeserved want. So here again, victims could be uh, brought under this. Section Article 51A, it talks about the fundamental duty of every citizen to have compassion for living creatures and to develop humanism. So this humanism could be towards the victims when they have suffered. Uh, the impact of crime. So if interpreted and expanded, these provisions can form the constitutional underpinnings of victimology. This is what the, constitu uh, the uh, report says, the 154th Law Commission report. And of course, CRPC. We have section 357, which talks about the um, uh, right to compensation. But in the research that we have done, we see that not many people have used this particular section, though the power under this uh, section is limitless. Still, it is not uh, used very often. There's one very um, uh, proactive judgment, I think that was by Justice um, Banumati when she was a district judge about the compensation in the Premananda case. So when that was delivered, it, it seemed like an exorbitant amount one lakh or something per uh, offender in that um, uh, Premananda case. But that was again confirmed by the uh, Supreme Court later. So the there is a, a lot of room for compensation for assistance to victim under this particular section. But it's not, uh, research has shown that it's not used very uh, often. And uh, we have another section, section 377 of the CRPC which talks about the state government and its right to prefer appeal for inadequate section, uh, sentences under Section 377. Again, research has shown that this has not been used as much as it could be. 
uh, in favor of victims. Then the other section, uh, appeal by the victim section 372. So if uh, against the acquittal of the accused, then uh, the conviction of the accused for lesser offense, for imposing inadequate compensation. So again, these sections can be used uh, in favor of victims. So we just need to uh, apply our mind and have a victim friendly approach, understanding the impact of the victimization. So um, that is what is the um, uh, main uh, aim of this kind of a lecture, I would say. So uh, the quantum of compensation is decided now we have after the amendment to be decided after uh, inquiry by the uh, district uh, state legal services or the state legal services uh, as the you know, situation would uh, require. So, and it also gives the relevant factors for awarding of compensation. You need to look at the gravity of the offense, the severity of the impact, the paying capacity of the accused, the needs for the needs of the victim. This is very, very crucial. Then loss of life, livelihood, then the death. So, because the victim definition includes the members also who are affected by the death of the victim. So we need to think about that as well when we talk about uh, victim compensation. So you see that uh, we have these uh, provisions in our legislation, not many, but something. And it's a good start if you can start uh, looking at it from the victim perspective and see how it would help our victims uh, uh, get justice from our existing system. So you see that we have these provisions, but where lies the challenge there? Is it the underlying uh, principle of the system like we saw? Or is it our interpretation of these systems that is hindering us from looking at the system in favor of victims? Or is it our inability to prioritize? So we need to think about this, where these are many, many questions that will uh, remain unanswered long after we have gone through this um, uh, webinar and many others maybe. Or is it our lack of readiness to dispense holistic justice to the victim? So these are the many, many questions that you need to contemplate and try to find answers for. And it's also uh, whether the pyrrhic defeat theory may be used. So we try to explain again uh, the persistence of the failing criminal justice system. And those who have the power to change the system are actually benefiting from the way it operates. Uh, whether it is uh, to determine how a criminal justice system that neither protects society nor achieves justice for the victims is still functioning. So these are questions that we need to ask. And lastly, who is benefiting from this failure? Is it the offenders and their associates? Who are the beneficiaries of this current system? So these, again, are more questions for us to understand. So it's refreshing to note that in spite of uh, there being no laws, there have been many, many uh, victim-friendly judgments in our country. So uh, they have proactive judgments which have been rendered uh, and also the public interest litigation in 1981 when the Apex Court opened the issue of the locus stand I in favor of the citizen who, or a stranger who was allowed to um, intervene in favor of the victim. So these are the ways in which we have got uh, many uh, favorable orders in our country. And uh, we have many, many um, judgments that we can refer to. One is this Maru Ram versus others and Union of India where uh, Justice Krishna had said that it's not only the responsibility of the CJS to restore and to punish the offender, but also to worry about the victim and to see uh, some reparation is given to him. So victimology must find fulfillment, not through the barbarity of the punishment, but also uh, thinking about the uh, victim who he calls here the loss of the forlorn. So this is just one of the many, many judgments. I don't know if we have time to go through all this, but these are the judgments you can look at uh, when you are uh, uh, reading uh, material on this. 
So how a victim of crime cannot be a forgotten man, says one judgment. Then it's the weakness of our jurisprudence that the victims of crime is still in the vanishing point of our criminal law. So these are the different judgments. I don't know how we are doing with time, whether we have time to go through all this. But uh, uh, yes, maybe you can read it at your own pace. So there are a lot of uh, victim-friendly judgments that we have that would uh, uh, show that our system does care about victims as well. So we need to see that for the government to act, citizens must be active and vigilant. So there's need for policy change. We need to examine laws, repeal some, replace them. So we need, we understood how uh, after the Nirbhaya, how the pain and the anger of the people was converted into a roadmap for the future and the Justice Varma Commission and the amendments that came after that. So the past few years, we've been seeing how the networking of the NGOs, the media, students, lawyers, everyone has brought about a huge change. We have many uh, legislations now that are victim friendly, the LGBT rights, senior citizens, um, uh, the national policies for uh, women and children and all the vulnerable groups. So we are trying to bring back the balance into this system. And we see the role of NGOs. Now we see whenever we look at the ratio, police is to public, judges is to public, we see that there is a huge gap. But when you look at these NGOs, you see that there are NGOs for every 400 people in our country. So they kind of represent the human face of the uh, uh, criminal justice system. And there is an old saying which says that God cannot be everywhere, so he created mothers. So similarly, the government cannot and is not everywhere. So there is the need for these non-governmental organizations. So we need to network with them and get input. So they become a kind of guardian for the criminal justice system. And they help the victims through this whole process of going through this criminal justice system. So um, uh, talking about this uh, acquisitorial and inquisitorial system that uh, the uh, various countries follow, when you look at the crime uh, statistics, you see that most of the countries that follow the uh, adversarial system or the acquisitorial system have large crime rates, US, India, Australia, UK. So when you, this is another question and this is another um, food for thought. When you look at it, is it this system that which has a lot of uh, crime happening in this kind of countries where this system of, is followed and when these victims do not report the crime, why do they not report the crime? Is it because they are uh, not sure they will get justice? So when they do not report the crime, what happens? And why they do not report the crime? Because there is no victim assistance. So when there is no victim assistance, there's no victim-friendly procedure, they do not report. And when they do not report, there's no reconciliation. And when there's no reconciliation, there is no healing for the victim. And they internalize that anger. So there's anger, there's frustration, and there's lack of coping skills. And finally, that comes out as a crime. So they uh, in, uh, indulge in offending behavior. So victim turned offender. This is another concept that there is in victimology that should help us understand the need for uh, attending to the needs of victims. Because if we do not, the victims turn into offenders. We know the case of the Gulabi um, gang in the north, I think it's in Rajasthan, where all the women get together, they wear those pink scarves. Gulabi is pink and they go and attack the men who have offended them. So this is not we, what we want because this is crime begetting another crime. So we want um, to see that society does not prepare uh, the crime and the criminal commits it. This is what was said by Buckle. So if society prepares the crime by not attending to the needs of victims, by not giving uh, justice, access to justice for the victims of crime, then we are preparing the uh, space for the crime to be committed. So uh, uh, in my research, I've said that uh, when you look at this, it looks like uh, the cause of crime, crime itself is the cause of crime. So victimization is the cause of crime. If you do not address that victimization, it could uh, result in another crime. So we should 
pay attention to this. So we need to understand that victim, if he is given, he or she is given victim assistance, that is as good as crime prevention. So this is another thing that should bring our focus to the victims. So we could be warned by this as well when we do not attend uh, to victims' needs and we do not uh, see that there is a balance in our system. So uh, we need to understand that the right of the offenders and the right of the victims, they need to be balanced. Uh, that will give the justice and rule of law. So when there are, when there is rule of law and there's justice both to the victim and the offender, then we can see that we would bring back the balance into the system. So we need to have a system where the victim does not have to stand on his or hers, her head to get access to justice, to get fair treatment, to get restitution, compensation and assistance. So we need a system where the uh, offender also continues to get his rights, but not at the cost of the victim's rights. So this is what we should envisage and we should try to, uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, dealings with the victims, try to uh, impress upon the um, need for this victim justice in our system. So we see that it's a very difficult balancing act, So, but it has to be done if we need to ensure justice to victims. So I rest my case. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a real eye-opener session for all the friends of mine who are from the legal fraternity who have joined in. For others from your fraternity, it would have been an added input to them. Uh, may I request the participants to kindly post your questions on the chat box? I'll uh, read out the question if you wish, or you can read out an answer, ma'am. There were already one or two questions out. here. Okay, yes. ma'am. Uh, there were one or two questions there. Uh, one from Mr. Balaji. What do you think are the greatest challenges of international criminal justice system uh, in the context of changes brought by modern technologies? What do you yeah. think are the greatest challenges of international criminal justice in the context of changes brought by modern technologies? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. It's very, very pertinent that now because of the increase in cybercrime and uh, particularly crimes like trafficking, they are the crimes that are uh, have multiplied with the use of technology. So we just uh, presented a project report about the use of technology in this uh, uh, in the crime of trafficking. So we need to be proactive, like the people who are working with the criminal justice system. We need to be proactive because it's now the technology is being used by the offenders by the perpetrators. So we need, as a criminal justice system, internationally and nationally, we need to tap the resources. The opportunities are many in the use of technology. So we need to use the same technology before the offenders and the perpetrators use that technology. So we have our cyber crime um, cells and our uh, for the prevention of trafficking. Now we have uh, introduced the system where the police are decoys in these chat boxes and they try to uh, pick up uh, offenders and they try to, they have a system in which uh, people looking at child pornography, they have a, they attract the people who are uh, looking at child pornography and they uh, automatically their IP address is sent there and then they are watched because once they uh, watch this child pornography, they will be looking for child victims of sexual abuse. So this is a, a way in which there are, there's huge opportunity in the international and the national thing, but we need to train our uh, officers to uh, use this technology to combat uh, these type of crimes. I see that Andhra Pradesh is uh, doing a great job when it comes to using uh, technology. So yes, there are a lot of opportunities and we need to tap those resources and be proactive before uh, the criminals, they are the ones who are using the technology now. So we need to cash in on that as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, what's the major role of counselors and psychologists for victim assistance in the prisons? In the prison, prison. or in the yes. police station? The, uh, the question is prison. Maybe you okay. can construe it as police station also. Mm, because uh, in the prisons, <laughs> we do not have victims. But yes, victims of abuse of power are there. But um, uh, see, uh, we did a study in, in the prison to study about the past victimization of the prisoners. So when we did that study, we found that many of them had history of victimization, which was not addressed. And then it was that which uh, caused them to commit a crime. And the crime that they committed was related to the victimization that they experienced as children or many years ago. So this, we saw that how uh, victims now, when they are in the uh, prison, because you said prison, when they are in the prison, if they have had past victimization, we need to address that. Otherwise, our research has shown that these prisoners, when they go out of prison, they will commit crimes and come back to the system again. So we need to address their past victimization, talk to them about their past victimization, see how it has impacted them. So in that way when you're talking about past victimization yes in the prison uh, the counselors now in Tamil Nadu I think this is one of the few states that has uh, prisoners uh, psychologists and counselors in prisons in all our prisons so at another conference in Delhi I was surprised to see that most states did not have this but in our state all the prisons have counselors have um, psychologists so they can uh, uh, talk to the victims and uh, of their past victimization and try to address that and to see how they can um, uh, make them understand that what was uh, there is an acceptance of what was uh, what had happened to them the injustice in that and then try to help them reconcile so they do not come out and commit a crime so recidivism is related to this past uh, victimization so uh, this is if you are meant prisons but if it's a police station of course you need uh, uh, counselors in police stations because when they come to commit the crime in the after uh, commit to report the crime in the aftermath of the victimization they are in a confused state so when they enter the police station they need to have counselors like i remember we were training a whole bunch of uh, about 2000 police officers who were appointed at one point in time in tamil nadu trained them to be reception officers, like they are the ones who receive the uh, 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 victims when they come to the police station. So police station becomes a kind of a uh, hospitality industry. It's a service, it's not a force. You must look at police as a service, not as a force. So they will, when you go to a hotel, how they uh, welcome you. There is a reception where they are nice to you, uh, treat you with dignity, treat you with respect. And this is what you need at a police station because then the recalling of that incident will be much clearer for the victim to report his crime. If you, if he is harassed at that point in time, he will not, he or she will not remember what uh, the color was the shirt of the offender, what was the number of the vehicle. So he needs to be uh, tackled with the help of psychologists. So his mind is calm that he's able to report and give you all the details about the crime and the criminal so that that would help us. So we need to understand that the police, the public prosecutor and the victim have to work together towards a conviction. So we need to be partners. So unless we three work together, we will not be able to get that conviction, which is access to justice for the victim. 